Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time for some more Bloodsword. We return to what appears to be a very nasty fight. Another death by initiative encounter. This is not good. You make your way back. As you negotiate the walkway above the infernal fiery pit, four winged serpents with eyes like molten lava and skin of flaming orange rise up to attack you. Anyone who is struck a by a blow of 15 or more points before deducting armour and still lives must turn immediately to section 3. You cannot flee, for as they can fly, they are too fast for you. They're rolling 3 dice plus 3 damage, so they're going to be averaging 13 to 14 damage per hit. They are likely to get a 15 in this fight. Furthermore, three of them are attacking the person in the front of the party marching order. This is really bad. Additionally, one is attacking our healer. It would be nice for Brother Kern and Ariadne to pull back a little and let Remy take place here to keep this one occupied. However, if Salamander number four hits Brother Kern, it's likely to be so much damage that he can't afford to move and will need to stand there and start defending. Which means... Remy and Ariadne are the only one who can hurt this salamander in round one. If it misses, we could try hitting it with Brother Kerr and try for a kill, but we need to get rid of at least one of these three next to Sir Alwyn first. So Remy's going to fire an arrow from his bow at salamander number one, because this has a clearer line of sight than trying to get through this one. Yes, I know they're flying around and all over the place, Remy fires an arrow, and he hits. It's a magic arrow fired from a magic bow. Three points after armour. It's not much, but it is a start. Now all the salamanders go. We'll start with salamander number one, attacking Sir Alwyn. That is a miss. Any miss is a good miss. Salamander number two also misses. Salamander number three also misses. We may be in, maybe onto a winner here, boys and girls. Salamander number four, attacking Brother Kern, hits. That's bad news for us. 21 points. 19 after armor will knock him down to 16 endurance. And we get to turn to section three. You scream in terror as the fiery serpent buffets you over the edge of the walkway and you plummet into the flames below. Each round you are in the flames, you take 1d6 damage with armour giving no protection. With levitation or a flight spell, you can rise back up to the walkway after just one round. There are no flight spells. Interesting. Maybe we could have learned one somewhere. An enchanter can get back to the walkway with a spell of immediate deliverance, but will take damage for each round the casting takes. Other characters must wait until their companions, if any, have slain all the of the fiery serpents and can then pull them up to safety. In other words, if Remy or Sir Alwyn falls down into that thing, they are probably dead. So, if there are other players still fighting the serpents, they continue the fight at 93 while you take damage from the flames each round as described above. If you're a sage or enchanter, rejoin the fight at 93 when you get back up to the walkway. If you are adventuring alone and are not a sage or enchanter, or do not have the flight spell, which we have never encountered, then there is no escape for you. Once you have burned to death, you will spend an age suffering the torment of the flame's infernal inhabitants. Your adventure ends here. Well, that's pretty grim. Interestingly, there's no falling damage. Brother Kern is in the pit. He will take 1d6 points of damage. Which did not... Did it? Did it say ignoring armour? Armour giving no protection. Correct. Right. 
So he will take three more points of damage, going to 13 endurance, and levitate up to the walkway. At least we don't have to worry about moving him now. <laughs> right. Ariadne is going to try and cast her Nemesis Bolt spell at Salamander number one. Nemesis Bolt is a complexity level five spell. So a one plus five is six. The Bolt of Magical Energy strikes the creature. This could be very good. 39 points of damage and obliterates it. It lets out a hideous shrieking cry as it kind of goes stiff and rigid, turns into embers and falls apart and they just tumble down into the flames below. What? I can imagine stuff. Uh, emboldened by this, Sir Alwyn will risk attacking. Look, he could defend while we try and blast all the others and Remy goes stands here and that's probably a good idea. But he's going to try and get rid of one more salamander. And if he falls in the fire, he's brave enough to take it. So, he'll, he'll reach out into the air and grab a handful of the collapsing, calcifying embers from that creature and use it to swipe at this thing for his improvised attack. Which will miss, fortunately, as he just kind of casts it aside and throws it away. But with one arm gone, the sword in the other hand is coming round... And it's, once again, always strikes true. For 22 points of damage, Maya's free armor is 19, so it has two endurance points remaining. You know what? First off, let's get rid of the Nemesis Bolt. Secondly, it would at this point be very nice for Remy to fire an arrow at that thing to finish it off. You know what, this is an extremely deadly fight. We have quick thinking. Remy, fire an arrow at that thing to finish it off. That is a miss. And that's now two magical arrows Remy has shot. There are only three remaining. We should save those for something important. Top of a new round, because Quick Thinking is an ability from Book 1 that allows Remy to, once per fight, get an extra turn. It is very potent. It has to happen at the end of the round, and then he goes first next time. So it's basically two in a row. He will move to here and attack this salamander with his sword, intent on keeping it away from the more vulnerable party members. He hits. 2d6 plus 1, I think. Um, yes. Seven points. Four after armor takes it down to 17 endurance points. We are not out of the woods yet. If those salamanders manage to knock Sir Alwyn into the fire, we may have trouble. Actually, we got trouble anyway. Salamander number two will attack Sir Alwyn, who has not had a chance to defend. That misses. Salamander number three will also attempt to snap at him with its jaws. Oh, wow, look at all those eights. That is perfect. Salamander number four will attack Remy, who knows how to dodge well and is not struck by it. Brother Kern will consider aiming an arrow at this. For, uh, Ariadne will... I want to say almost... Wait, no, sword thrust... Um, if we can get rid of this... Oh, we can get rid of this. Right. So Alwyn will go first. And make the unarmed attack on the nearly dead Salamander. That's a hit. That's enough to take it out of the fight. I now feel more confident in our ability to survive this one. And with the blood sword itself, he will swipe at this one. For an amazing... Usual 4d6 plus 3 damage. 20 points goes down to 18 of armor, so it has 3 endurance points remaining. This is very good for us. Um, 
In that case, Ariadne will prepare a... Brother Kern will defend. Ariadne will prepare a... Um, chain Lightning, I think. Yes. No. No Sword Thrust. There we go. Round three. Remy will once again attempt to apply his sword to this creature in a rather hostile and unfriendly manner. That's a good start. Ah, one point after armor. This one is putting up a bit of a fight, and that's okay. Salamander number three will attack Sir Alwyn. Oh my goodness. And Salamander 4 will attack Remy. The amount of 8s the Salamanders have rolled to try and hit Sir Alwyn is unbelievable. Especially given how much this program usually hates me. Brother Kern will ready an arrow. Sure, and fire it at this one over here. That is unfortunately not a good shot. But it was well worth the attempt because Sir Alwyn cannot... Oh, that's going to be a bother. Right. Oh, well. We'll finish off with a blood sword. 46 plus 3. Yep, it's dead. And Ariadne will attempt to cast her sword for a spell, also allowing us to... Reduce the initiative window significantly. Sword Thrust is a level 3 spell. A 2 plus 3 is 5. A magical blade of force impales the creature. For 10 points of damage, that's 7 after armor, knocking it down to a mere 9 endurance points. Now... It would be nice if Remy could get out of the way and let Sir Alwyn in to fight it. However, he can't, so he'll just hit it instead. Maybe if it knocks him off the bridge. Well, his attack misses. The Salamander attempts to knock him off the bridge. That's a hit. And Remy takes 15, 13 after armour knocks him down to 26 endurance points and he falls in the fire. Remy has no magical means or of, of levitation or fighting so he is going to stay in the fire for the rest of the fight. Also Ariadne needs to remove that sword for us spell that she cast last round. Right well in that case Sir Alwyn is going to come up and try and murder this thing We'll go for the kick of justice, the boot, the sabaton of righteous might and miss. Then we'll hit it with the blood sword for 14 points of damage. It's going to be 11 after armor. Oh, it only has 9 endurance points remaining. Which means as it crumbles, we can get Remy out of the fire. That was a nasty fight. Very nasty. Let's get out of here. You slay the last serpent, which falls fluttering feebly into the flames below. Hurriedly, you make your way out of this hellish pit of the chamber of door to the chamber of doors, but not before making a six-point healing roll. Uh. 4, 6 is a 24. Um, we'll give the 6 bit back to Brother Kern. Give him another 6. Uh, 19. Um, we'll give 2 to Remy. Which leaves us 10. To give to Sir Alwyn, putting him back on 29. We do not have five rods coloured red, blue, white, green and gold. 
we have the white rod and the ruby red rod. Oh, I wonder if we're going to have to add all the numbers together and turn to that section to, to prove we have them. Very, very, very mid to late fighting fantasy. Or if we're going to have to assemble the numbers in the, cor the rods in the correct order, <laughs> and that can also involve the numbers on the rods. Right, we've done the red door of red death and the wh white door of white life. We have the blue moon, which is illusion, the plague star and the gift star. I, I think I want to do blue or green last. Let's go for the golden door of gift star. It's random. Right. You approach the door marked with gift star's symbols. Gift star is the bringer of fate, the bestower of unexpected coincidences, the toss of a coin for good or ill. We do not have a golden rod. However, we are missing uh, 13 and 6, like 19 health. Okay, we'll go for an 8 point heal. Two eights of 16, so we got eight more points to give back. We'll give two of them to Brother Kern and six to Remy, which puts us in a slightly better position. You step through the corridor, the door into a corridor of clean grey stone. The floor is covered with red and gold, with a red and gold mosaic. We can go down the corridor or head back to the large chamber and choose another door. Well, we can go back. It's literally showing us it's back to 119, a familiar number by now. So we can dis we are being given a, a choice to retreat, which we have not been given in the others. A possible hint that maybe we should deal with the other two doors first. However, no matter how long we put it off, we will need to come back here and try and get the golden rod. So I think we should do so now while we are here already. You walk forward. A section of floor gives way under your feet. Oh, I should have put Remy in front because it's random stuff. You put Remy in front. That makes sense. Yeah. Roll or die. Odds or evens. Okay. Could be anything. Well, we'll just first a six point healing roll. Okay. Six fours are 24. Uh, 18 after refunding the six we spent. Four to heal up Brother Kern. Gives us 14 points, which puts Remy, he only needed seven. I mean, look, now we get to roll for the trap, right? The trap is odds or evens, evens. Same four as before. By a stroke of remarkable good luck, you manage to grab the lip of the pit before falling in. Below you, you see that the floor of the pit is lined with vicious steel spikes. In any case, you haul yourself out and press on. The corridor ends soon after with three doors, one directly ahead, one to the left, and one to the right. They are all of wood, featureless, and unmarked. I think we should go straight ahead. The door leads into an octagonal room with some stairs up at the far end. In the middle of the room is a shallow pit out of which a golden light billows up. In it, a smoky visage forms, a huge glowing face rippling like water. Its eyes and mouth are mere black rents in a mask of golden vapour. The face speaks with a voice like the sound of metal rasping on stone. Uh, 
I am the Oracle of Gift Star. If you pay the price, I will speak for you. You ask what the price is, but it merely says, Pay the price or leave me be. Choose. We can agree to pay the price without knowing what it is. No, that's probably going to be something quite bad. Or leave and go up the stairs on the far side of the room. I feel strongly that whatever the price will be, it will not be a mere insignificant thing. And it will be something we will miss. We shall carry on without it, without any advice that it may or may not give. You ascend the stairs. As you near the top, it appears that they end in a blank stone wall, but a step shifts under you and a door-shaped slab of stone rumbles upwards ahead of you. Stepping through into a chamber of natural rock, you are greeted by a an overpowering stench. Ooh, scanning issue there? Before you is a creature of bubbling slime that continually changes its form before your eyes. It exudes pseudopods, tentacles, chitinous insectoid limbs, and huge grasping arms, seemingly at random. Gluttonous eyes open all over its body, and stalks and antennae rip out of it, some with eyes or mouths at their tips, before being sucked back into the amorphous slime that constitutes its being. Gaping moors lined with teeth or dripping ichor split open or seal over with a sickening plopping sound. Some orifices emit noxious gases, other sinewy tongues running with organic juices or coated in vicious-looking rasping spines. You are seized with revulsion. Then, to your horror, the slab of stone behind you slams shut. Oh, mate, we are getting a nemesis bolt ready right now. Possible. I don't think Serverline Fraum is going to work on this. This very much seems like a Chaos Spawn or Shogoth or something really nasty. The being scuttles toward you on a myriad insectoid legs. You must fight. The Anarch! Fighting prowess of 8, psychic ability of 6, armor rating variable. Every time you strike it, roll one die. The number you roll is its armor rating, that is, what type of skin it happens to have in the area you hit at the time. Damage per blow is 3d6, awareness is 12, so it's going first, and endurance is 30. Remy is in front. Okay, it's a it's a five by four room. We can sort that quite quickly. Note, when it attacks, roll one die. This is the number of attacks it will make against its chosen target. That is, how many appendages it happens to have at that time to attack with. And a fighting prowess of eight. Ugh, I'm glad Remy's its main target. It also regenerates. At the end of each round... Roll one die. That is the number of lost endurance it regains. It can never have more than 30 endurance. It is immune to servile enthrallment. It has no mind, as humans would understand it, but all other spells work as normal. In other words, we want to hit it with Night Howl straight away. Every time it does damage to someone, roll a die. On a 1 or 2, no special effect. On a 3 or 4, make a psychic ability check or be paralysed for 3 rounds... On a 5 or 6, lose one fighting prowess for the duration of this combat. Okay. A challenging foe, and one with very high awareness. I'd better go make up a map. And so, it is in this chamber that we face a physical embodiment of anarchy itself. Exactly the kind of chaotic presence that the Gift Star would approve of. I mean, he's basically a gambler of a gift star, right? Well, the anarchy embodiment will go first, and then I suppose we'll have to see what we can do about it. It surges forwards to attack Remy, and it makes four attacks with its fighting prowess of eight. Remy, however, is a suitably hard target, so hopefully some of these will miss. One... Two, three, four. Two of the attacks 
hit. It does a mere 3d6 damage. Remy can take a few of these. First one, 11. Second one, 13. So that's going to be 9 and 11. So 20 damage total, popping him on 21 endurance. Nasty, unpleasant, but he can live. Being on half health, Remy will blatantly defend. So Almoon will not defend. He will step up and, you know, grab hold of it with one hand for his unarmed attack and hack at it with a sword for another. So, oh wait, but it hit Remy twice. Extra thing. First attack. A free second attack of four. Psychic ability check will be paralyzed for three rounds for both of them. Oh, bugger. Remy, good luck. Remy's paralyzed for three rounds. Uh, uh, in which case he's probably dead. Um, yes, I did spell that correctly. Well then, we need to hit this thing hard and fast. Sir Alwyn, make that initial attack. Six, good. 2d6 plus three is six, and it has an armor rating of five against this attack, so it takes one whole point of damage. It's also regenerating. The blood sword will hit significantly harder than that, for 4d6 plus 3. 22. And against that, its malleable morphing flesh has an armor rating of 2, so it takes 20 more damage. That is very serious and good. Dropping it down to 9 endurance points. Uh, in which case, Brother Kern will charge in and try and beat it with his hitting stick. That's a hit. 2d6 plus 1. Look, we gotta save Remy. It's like Bubba in Forrest Gump. I gotta set farm, Bubba! Damn it, I, I misremembered the line. I was thinking it's gonna be I gotta save Bubba, but it's not. Right, okay. And its armor is a 4, so it takes no damage from his quarter stuff. Ariadne will cast the Nemesis Bolt spell. Well, 50 50. She'll give it a damn good try. 1d6. Plus five, eight. And her current psychic ability is an eight, so the Nemesis spell has been cast. Armor does apply. However, 76 plus seven, 37 damage. We will roll armor anyway, so six, 31 damage on its remaining nine endurance points. The fight is at an end. I had anticipated it being taking a few more rounds to kill. But that was not the case. Wow. Uh, we'll keep Remy in front and stick this as our marching order for now. Obviously also this is a 5x5 five five room so I ignored the bottom row of squares. At this point, this is a very good example of why a lot of these combats are death by initiative by design. Essentially, at this point, we have such powerful healing in the form of a sage that any and every encounter has to kill us in one fight. Otherwise, we will be on full health again for the next one. We can no longer rely... Well, the, the, the authors can no longer rely on combat encounters to grind us down over the course of an adventure. And in all fairness, with the Sage's healing, we were generally in reasonably good shape whenever we got into a fight anyway, not necessarily on full health. Now, you could say, then why did they give us such powerful healing? It's because to, they want to make this final adventure feel epic and hit us with the hardest encounters they possibly can. 
I wouldn't like to imagine a single character trying to cross that bridge with the salamanders. My gut feeling so far is the sweet spot seems to be a party of two or three heroes. Trying to get four friends together to play one character each back in the old days was really hard. It was easy to rope in two friends, not always the same two, to play a party of three, which meant one class would always be missing. We didn't have a someone play two characters option. And I imagine getting a mate together to play a two-person party would also be not that difficult. You could also play one person on your own. You could either play one mighty hero or a whole party of four. Let's see what happens now that the anarchy creature is defeated. At last, the thing falls. Taking no chances, you hack it into small pieces. Amid the foul-smelling blubber, you find a short golden rod with the number 100 engraved on it. Remy's taking that... Note it down on your character sheet to make sure you record the number 100 beside it. Remy's taking it because he... Remy can't take it. We probably don't need the Crimson Bats gem anymore, Remy. But he wants it. It's precious. So, Sir so Alma will take it. Golden Rod 100. So it's at 150, 166 so far. Two more rods to go. I suspect we may then be adding them all together. There is no way out of here except that you notice a small hole in the slab behind you. Inserting the rod once and pulling it out again activates the mechanism and the slab slides up once more. You retrace your steps uneventfully back to the main chamber of coloured doors. And we'll have Brother Kern make a... Oh, five point healing roll. Okay, we got 30 points back. <clears throat> we'll refund the five to Brother Kern. And the other 15 will go towards... Sorry, the other 25 will go towards the 20 points of healing that Remy left with five points left... Needed with five points left over. Okay. We do not have the five rods yet. We still have the green door of Plague Star and the blue door of Blue Moon. <sighs> the Plague Star, it's likely to be diseases. Um, so we either want to do it last. Would we expect the diseases to be cured at the end of it? Not necessarily. Oh, sod it. Let's just go for the green door. If you have a green rod, we do not. Otherwise, the door swings open and you step through. The first thing that strikes you is the stench of dead and decaying organic matter. You have stepped into a huge natural cavern lit by a greenish glow that radiates from the ground. The floor is covered in rotting slime, a putrescent soup in which you can still see the remains of human bodies in various stages of decomposition. Legs and arms protrude from it at all angles, skeletal hands clawing desperately at the empty air as if in a mute plea for aid. Towards the centre of the cavern you can see something large, Gingerly, you set off across the slime. It's going to be a great unclean one, isn't it? Or something similar. In the centre of the cavern stands a large sarcophagus. Before you can reach it, a sound causes you to turn. A horrific sight greets you. Three humanoid shapes, dripping putrid flesh, are hobbling towards you. Leprous arms reaching out. Their faces are ruins of warped flesh. Their bodies exude a sickening stench of putrefaction. Greenish pus suppurates from the thousand cankerous wounds. Maggots writhe and flesh sloughs off to fall to the ground with a, with a glutinous slap. They are the unclean, and you must fight them. Unclean! Unclean! Note, if you are wounded by one of these foul creatures, turn to 358 unless you are carrying the blood sword or you require immunity disease with the orb from Plague and Book 2. Well, we know what's going on there. Um, they have an awareness of 5. Oh my god, we're going to murder these things. Um, 
and fighter pressure 6. This will be a fairly easy fight. You can flee by running out of the cavern back to the room of doors. If you come back here later, all surviving Lazars will have regenerated, but those you destroyed on this occasion will remain destroyed. So. Uh, let's go make a map. A kind of cavern of filth, I suppose. See you in a bit. The unclean Lazars have risen up to face us. They're not great unclean ones, they're more like plague bearers of Nogal. So that's exactly what I've gone looking for for pictures. Hey, let's uh, get our fight on. They're not the greatest of combatants, but they are dangerous all the same. Remy will go first. He will... Ooh, I mean... Yeah, sorry. He will go up to here to engage these two, striking up the one that no one else will be reaching. No, no, we'll go for the one that Sir Alwyn will blatantly be attacking very soon. Get that sword swinging, Remy. You know you can do it. Bosh! Hits. 2d6 plus 1 damage. 6. Yeah, okay, so it's 3 points after armour, but it's a start. You know, 27 points there is a bit tough for Sir Alwyn to go kill. Speaking of which, let's go kill. Sir Alwyn strides into the middle of the fight, joyously engaging the foul, pox-ridden filth. With a mighty blow of his sword, the Sword of Life probably takes great... Oh, I can turn the, map, the grid off, can't I? Um, here we go. Right. The Sword of, of Life probably takes great offence at the presence of such light-destroying disease. Ah, 11 damage ain't much. 8 will go down to 19. And then, as it's kind of like down on its knees... Um, he'll, like, kick it in the head. Yeah, because he can. He's a warrior. He knows how to fight. He's seen the shit film 300 with the rubbish end. Yeah. By which, I don't mean regarding historical accuracy or anything, I mean more the way it was dramatised and, yeah, you know. Look, no disrespect to anyone who worked on the film, it's not like it was the Viking warriors and the sea serpent. <laughs> <laughs> now that is a bad film the film's director literally described the filming of of that as the worst two weeks of his life <laughs> it's so bad one of the viking women has fucking sunglasses on <laughs> yeah and the sea serpent gets like less than two minutes of screen time possibly even less than one minute so, six more damage there. It may be best if we do not expose Brother Kern to these pox-ridden beasts. He can hang back here. You know what? We can shoot an arrow, though, at this, this outlier here. Try and reduce it ever so slightly. We'll knock up another arrow and loose it from our bow. That will miss. Hmm... Archery doesn't seem very effective, but it's probably worth holding on to for those important fights where we can't get into combat. And Ariadne has no spell prepared. I see three foes, uh, one of whom... No, 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 no. I can guarantee Remy won't kill that one, because he won't be able to roll high enough. And then these three will be simultaneous. So she will prepare Sheet Lightning. One sheet does plenty. Which is always funny, because in the original adverts, it always sounded like he was saying one shit does plenty. Which, of course, makes total sense if it's toilet paper, but it's not. It's like kitchen toilet, kitchen roll type stuff. Anyway, yeah, she's going to try and blast these three, significantly weakening all of them so they can be finished off. The three will now attack. The first unclean one will assault Remy who is good at dodging and is not hit. The second one will randomise a target. Top to bottom, it goes for Sir Alwyn. In other words, the target it can hit. It does. Excellent. 13 points of damage will take off four from the armour and nine points put Sir Alwyn on 32 endurance. He is not infected because he is carrying the blood sword. 
And the third unclean one will also attempt to attack him. And hits. 13. Wow. Another nine points of damage. Knocks him down to 23. Okay. I suppose we might have to have more than a 10 point healing roll from Brother Kern at the end of this fight, depending on if anyone else gets hurt. All right. Well then, Remy will attack the unwounded one next to him. Look, its skin's falling off already, okay? He might as well just help it with a few quick slices of his blade and does not quite roll low enough. Ariadne will take the current turn and attempt to cast Sheet Lightning, which is a complexity level 4 spell. Let's do it. 1d6 plus 4. So a 4 or less. Ah, a 9. Does not quite cast it. In which case, Sir Alwyn will attack the healthy one with his blood sword. And hit for 16. 13 after armor. Knocks it down to 17 endurance. And then he will cuff this one round the side of the head with his armored mitten. Like boosh. Not the one he just struck, but the other because it's on 13 endurance, which he intends to significantly reduce. Yeah! Knocks him down to 9 endurance. Better chance of him being killed by sheet lightning in the future. Brother Kern will not waste an arrow. The first of the unclean leprous creatures will attack Remy. Missing completely. The second will pick a target while it still can. It goes for Sir Alwyn. It clearly knows who it can hit, and hit it does. Oh, this could be a bit of a problem. Five. One point after armor. Five minus four is one. Makes up for the 13s they got previously, and the final one will also assault him. Uneffectively. Remy will attack the healthy monster. He hits. For four points of damage, <laughs> he rolled really badly. After armor, that's just one. Takes him down to a mere 29 endurance points. Ariadne will attempt to cast Sheet Lightning. 1d6 plus 3. Now a 5 and 6 chance. She definitely succeeds. Lightning blasts the creatures, striking all of them. 2d6 plus 2 damage. Excellent. The first one, which is likely to survive... Eight points, yet will knock off armor, so that is five. Takes it down to 24 endurance points. The one most likely to be pe be defeated, I was going to say most likely to perish, 14 points, 11 after armor, it's got nine endurance. It is obliterated, frazzled, singed, sm a smoking wreck. And the third one, 12 points, nine after armor, knocks it down to eight endurance points. At this point... This is looking like a much shorter fight. Because this is what we do. We clear her psychic ability. We remove the sheet lightning. Sir Alwyn will take a turn. And that's got eight endurance. We'll send in Brother Kern to see if he can fit. No, it might pick him as a target and infect him. We'll hold back. Okay, fine. Hit it with a sword. Magic sword. Magic sword kills the thing. The plus three will cancel out its armor rating. 21. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Maybe this isn't a kill you straight away fight, but the disease could be a problem over the course of the adventure. So that makes it the unclean one's turn. It will attack Remy, who is a hard target, and it misses by one. So close. Remy will try and strike it with his sword because he can he does six points three points after armor look he's not on his own okay he's not on his own at all the warrior's gonna come in and like grab the back of its head and ram its face into the floor or something and then as it slips and slides about as it gets up to his feet he'll attack it with a sword as well right 
Gauntlet of Pain, yes. Gauntlet of Pain inflicts 7 points of damage, 4 points after armor, taking it down to 17. We're unlikely to get a kill for Blood Sword, but we can try. It could roll high for once 15. Okay. That's 12 after armor, knocks it down to 5 endurance points. Ariadne doesn't really want to waste a, a spell on this, so she will prepare a spell for... You know what? I've been constantly saying I want to prepare Night Howl, so she probably won't cast it this fight. But in the next one, quite likely. Brother Kern will defend, ready to heal after the fight. The monster will pick a target, top to bottom. It goes for Sir Alwyn, of course it does. It's frustrated with trying to hit let Remy so much. And it misses completely. Remy, can you get the kill? Nope, he misses. So Alwyn hits it with a blood sword, and those watching think it's all over. It is now. That was 19 points of damage. Okay. That first fight is at an end. That feels suspiciously easy. If they gave us any diseases, I imagine that might not have been the case. Let us continue at this location. We probably aren't done here yet. Not even remotely. The last of the noisome creatures falls with a splash to the floor of the cavern to add its organic rot to the cesspool. Shuddering, you move on to examine the tomb. It is a large slab of stone, the top of which is carved to represent a regal woman dressed in robes, wearing a torque and holding a short scepter in her hands. Oh man, if I still had that torque from book four that allegedly gave protect prevention protection from mind control, but all such items have been removed from us. Around the edge, many symbols and hieroglyphs are carved, mostly meaningless even to a sage, but we shall examine it more closely before opening the tomb. Just in case. However, let's make that 12 point healing roll, because sod it, we can. Yep, we get 36 points back, so... So 24 to give to Sir Alwyn, who only needed 19. You find an inscription you can read. The Bride of Pestilence. May she rest in peace. The stars rule her. Well, look, we can open the tomb or return to the Chamber of Doors. Lots of opportunities to back out of this one. I think we've got to just open up the tomb. It seems to be the only way we can gain the rod from this location. You lift the lid of the stone coffin. It comes away with unexpected ease. Inside is the body of a woman, long dead, a shriveled husk of dry, leathery skin drawn tight as a drum over ancient bones. Long black hair covers her torso. She is dressed in green and yellow raiment of fine construction. In her skeletal hands is a green rod with the number 100 marked on it. You take the rod and step back, expectant, but nothing happens. No limbs twitch, no long closed eyes flick open, no withered hands reach out to claim back its prize. Note you have the rod on your character sheet and make sure you note the correct number beside it. Green rod, 100. Something tells me... We're not done here. Mostly because I saw something about highest awareness in the remainder of the paragraph. The character of the highest awareness must roll two dice and try to score equal to or under his or her awareness. That would be Remy, and his awareness is a nine. This is clearly to notice something happening, or that the rod we have received is a fake. An eight. That is a success. You notice a thin copper torque hidden under her hair. 
It was also engraved on the lid. It is covered in star symbols. Will you take it? It's Remy. He's going to take it. And then we'll all say, oh, Remy, what have you done? It is a talk of reanimation. If there is only one person in the party, it will be of no use. However, if in a multiplayer party someone is killed, the talk can be placed around that player's neck. He or she will come back, into, back to life, but as a zombie, obedient to the person who placed the talk. The zombie is useful only in combats as an extra fighter. It cannot make decisions, nor act as its old character. For example, if it was a sage, it cannot turn to sage paragraphs. It cannot cast spells, and all its attributes will be at minus one, except for endurance, which is at plus ten. It is immune to psychic spells. Note talk of reanimation, C257 for effects, to remind you of its properties should you need to use it. The talk of reanimation can be used only once, as it must be left on reanimated zombie in order to keep it alive. Gingerly, you step away from the dead queen's corpse, half expecting it to rise up with grasping talons and staring eyes. Perhaps if we had left the talk of reanimation upon it, that is exactly what it would have done. But nothing happens. You leave the cavern of Plague Star and go back to the Chamber of Doors. Remy can't actually carry that. Ariadne can. Let us hope we do not need to make use of that at all, ever, in our quest. But if any of us should fall... Oh, we got the optional rule where people... Ah, so that's practically a useless item. Okay. We, no long, we do not have all five rods yet. We still require the blue door, blue moon. But looking at the time, it's probably a good time for me to stop recording here. I've got things I need to do later on. So I'm going to leave this one here. I hope you've all enjoyed this episode, and I will look forward to seeing you all in the very next one. I'm going to say goodbye for now, and cheerio everyone. See you all soon, and keep up the amateur heroics. We're all doing the best we can.